the most crucial presidential election coming up uh, in just a few weeks. So last week, I mentioned that the election of 1860 was by far the most crucial election in American history because uh, it led directly to the outbreak of the Civil War. And if there was a second most crucial election, it would be the election of 1876. So we're going to look at five different elections in today's presentation, beginning with the election of 1876. Now, the year 1876 was a centennial year celebrating 100 years of independence. And most Americans in 1876 wanted to get beyond the Civil War that had ended just 11 years earlier. They began to wonder whether supporting African Americans was really worth dividing the country, whether support for Blacks was a good idea or not. And in fact, the 1876 election was in some ways a second civil war. Both sides threatened violence during the campaign. Each party had its own militia. White gangs in Louisiana and South Carolina and Florida and Georgia went to the polls to intimidate black voters, which hopefully will not be replicated in the November 3rd election, although um, there is some concern about voter intimidation. The sitting president during the election was Ulysses S. Grant. And during the election, he staffed military forts in Washington, DC, in case a second civil war erupted over the election. The election of 1876 proved to be the most disputed American election, at least until the Florida recount of 2000. The candidate who clearly won the popular vote and who may even have won the electoral vote was denied victory in 1876. So in order to understand the significance of this election, we have to understand the historical context. The 1876 election took place against the backdrop of reconstruction. Reconstruction began immediately after the Civil War, and it refers to the period from 1865 to 1877, when the Southern states that had seceded were brought back into the Union. During this period of Reconstruction, federal troops were stationed throughout the South. And in order for the South to be readmitted to the Union, they had to accept the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery, the 14th Amendment, which granted citizenship for the freed slave, and the 15th Amendment, which gave voting rights to adult Black males. And so once the Southern states accepted the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, they were brought back into the Union. During Reconstruction, there were social welfare programs that provided free public education for the newly freed African Americans. And federal troops defended the newly won rights of Blacks from attack by the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist terrorist groups. So that's what was going on as we moved to the election of 1876. The Republican Party expected to nominate a popular senator from Maine by the name of James G. Blaine. But when it was revealed that Blaine had some involvement in a railroad scandal 
The Republicans then nominated Rutherford B. Hayes, the governor of Ohio. During the Republican nominating convention, it took seven ballots for the delegates to uh, reach an agreement on Rutherford B. Hayes. And so there was a sense that Hayes was a compromise candidate. And Hayes agreed that he would serve only one term if he won the election. On the Democrat side, the nominee was Samuel J. Tilden, who had been the governor of New York. So Rutherford B. Hayes on the left, governor of Ohio, Samuel Tilden, governor of New York. Tilden was known as a reformer, and he had attracted considerable attention when he prosecuted the corrupt political boss of the New York City Democratic Party by the name of William Marcy Boss Tweed. Now, there were no outstanding differences between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party platform in 1876. So because there were no outstanding differences over issues, the campaign denigrated into personal attacks on the two candidates. Tilden had become a wealthy lawyer in New York City, and he was accused of participating in fraudulent railroad deals. And the Republicans made much of the fact that Tilden had not served in the Civil War. Tilden had purchased a substitute during the Civil War, which was entirely legal. If you had $300, you could pay someone to stand in for you and you would thereby avoid the draft. Hayes, on the other hand, had served heroically in the Union Army. In fact, he had been wounded several times. And the Republicans continually reminded the voters that Hayes had participated in the war. And by emphasizing that, the Democrats criticized Hayes for waving the bloody shirt that is for um, reminding voters about the Civil War. The election of 1876 became notorious, not so much because of its tactics, but for the conflicted resolution that followed Tilden's apparent victory. On election night, this was the result. Tilden had won four 3.3 million popular votes, 300,000 more than the popular vote total of Rutherford B. Hayes. Tilden won 184 electoral votes to just 165 for Rutherford B. Hayes. And so Tilden went to bed on November 7th, 1876, convinced that he was the first Democrat in 20 years to be elected president. After all, he had a quarter of a million more votes than Hayes. However, the election was deadlocked because the 184 electoral votes that Samuel Tilden had won was one short of the required majority. He needed 185. Four states had disputed election returns, Oregon, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida. And collectively, those four states had 20 electoral votes. So the eight electoral votes of Louisiana, the four electoral votes of Florida, the seven electoral votes of South Carolina, and one of the three electoral votes in Oregon were disputed. Now, the three Southern states were all under Republican legislature control. And in those states, there were reports of ballot stuffing, of people voting more than once, of voter intimidation, and other forms of election fraud. 
In Louisiana, armed gangs of Democrat, Democratic supporters burst into Republican meetings and murdered several Republican elect, elected officials. In Florida, a group of black men endured a mock lynching and had to promise not to vote Republican before they were allowed to be free. The dispute in Oregon was particularly um, unsettling, um, but ultimately the one electoral um, vote that was in dispute went to Hayes, but the election was still undecided. Somehow the federal government would have to determine which results were legitimate and which candidate won the disputed uh, electoral votes. Now, unlike in 1800 and in 1824, this election did not go into the House of Representatives. Instead, both parties agreed to form a commission to decide where the disputed electoral votes would go. This commission had seven Democrats and seven Republicans from Congress. And it had a Supreme Court justice as the 15th member. So there were 15 members of this commission. Now the Supreme Court justice had been a Republican. So on the commission, there were eight Republicans and seven Democrats. And the final vote by the Electoral Commission went along party lines. And so all 20 of the disputed electoral votes went to Hayes, giving Hayes 185 to Tilden's 184. And so Hayes was declared president. Now, this decision by the commission was called the Compromise of 1877. The votes of all four disputed states went to Hayes. Hayes became the president, but the Republicans had to agree to remove federal troops from the South as part of their end of the bargain. And by removing federal troops from the South, that ended reconstruction. That ended the protection of the rights of African Americans. Another part of the compromise was to use federal money to rebuild railroads in the South. So these decisions were made behind the scenes to ensure that the Democrats would accept all disputed electoral votes going to Hayes rather than Tilden. Now, I already mentioned that Hayes had said he would serve only a single term. And so that um, was a factor in the Democrats being willing to give all the, elector the, the disputed electoral votes to Hayes. And as one might, be, one might have expected, Hayes thus took office under a cloud of suspicion after all. He lost the popular vote and these disputed electoral votes were given to him by this commission. And so some people openly mocked his presidency as referring to him as Rutha Fraud B. Hayes. Um, and they referred to him as his fraudulency. So the significance of the election of 1876 cannot be understated. As federal garrisons were withdrawn from one Southern state after another, black emancipation ran into a wall of white supremacist bigotry. And so here is a cartoon showing a member of the Ku Klux Klan shaking hands with a member of the White League. And the losers in the election of 1876 were African Americans who saw one right after another being revoked. Those Southern governments 
now passed Jim Crow laws that suppressed African Americans for the next 70 years. Wow. The white plantation class regained political control of Southern state governments. And thus, in effect, the election of 1876 repealed the results of the Civil War. So even though slavery ended, Blacks were relegated to sharecroppers, which was really slavery by another name. Blacks were prevented from voting um, through the poll tax, through the grandfather clause. And um, as a result, the election of 1876 was referred to by some as the theft of the century or the fraud of the century. It was arguably the low point of American presidential democracy. And finally, the election was decided in favor of the Republican Hayes because the Republicans were in control of the electoral votes in the disputed Southern states. Just as in 2000, when the Republican George W. Bush became president because Republicans controlled the state legislature of Florida. And we will examine that election next week. Now let's move on to the election of 1884. The election of 1884 shook up politics in the United States. It brought a Democrat, Grover Cleveland, to the White House for the first time in more than a quarter century. Few presidential elections were as vicious as the one in 1884 that pitted the Republican candidate, James G. Blaine, against the Democrat, Grover Cleveland. It was a campaign marked by notorious mudslinging, including a paternity scandal. Not only was the election of 1884 tumultuous, but it set the stage for several presidential elections to follow in the 19th century. In the 1884 election, the Democrats raised the mantra, James G. Blaine, the continental liar from the state of Maine. And during the campaign, it was revealed that Cleveland, who was a bachelor, had an affair with a widow by the name of Maria Halpern. And she had given birth out of wedlock to a son. And so this cartoon shows uh, candidate Grover Cleveland um, having to deal with this um, paternity case during the election. Mariah, Maria Halpern claimed that Cleveland was the father and then Cleveland did what no sane politician had ever done in the past and would ever do in the future. He admitted his paternity and agreed to pay Maria child support. And when this issue was brought forth in the campaign, Republicans began the chant, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Uh -huh. The 1884 election, perhaps because of this scandal, was closer than many people expected. Cleveland won the popular vote by a very narrow margin, by less than half a percent, but he won the electoral vote by a wide margin. Blaine lost the state of New York by less than a thousand votes. So it was a very close election, but Cleveland ultimately won. And so, in answer to the refrain, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? The victorious Democrats gloated, he's gone to the White House, ha, ha, ha. Other Democrats bellowed, hooray for Maria, hooray for the kid. I voted for Cleveland and I'm damn glad I did. Now, when Cle Cleveland entered the White House, he was still a bachelor. Now, early in his career, he had a law partner 
who died, leaving a six-year-old daughter by the name of Frances. And Cleveland became her legal guardian. Um, that was an agreement that he had made with his law partner. Fifteen years later, in 1885, President Cleveland, at the age of 48, married Francis, who was then 21. So he was her legal guardian when she was six years old. And he ultimately married her when he was president and when Francis turned 21. And so Francis Folsom Cleveland became the youngest first lady in US history. Um, and they had a daughter. And they named the daughter Ruth. And the Nestle's Corporation named a candy bar after her. And that's where we get the candy bar Baby Ruth. It was not named for the baseball player Babe Ruth. Rather, it was named for the child that was born from the marriage between President Cleveland and Francis Folsom Cleveland. So that's a little trivia that uh, you might want to share with anyone who eats Baby Ruth candy bars. So let us now move to the election of 1896, one of the most dramatic and complex presidential elections in US history. The election of 1896 is seen as a beginning of a new era in American politics. It was referred to as realign the realignment election. Ever since the election of 1800, American presidential contests had on some level been a referendum on whether the country should be governed by agrarian interests or industrial interests. This was the last election in which a candidate tried to win the White House by winning the farm vote, by depending only on uh, agrarian votes. And that's why this election is called the realignment election. In the 1890s, the American people were deeply divided over the nation's monetary system. Should the United States have a currency that is backed up only by gold, or should the American currency be backed up by both gold and silver? That was the big debate in the election of 1896. And it was a result of a financial panic. Three years earlier, the Panic of 1893. It was the worst depression in American history up to that time. 600 banks failed. 15,000 businesses failed. Four million people were unemployed. 25%, a full quarter of all the railroads in the country uh, were failing and were taken over by financial companies. Now, many people believe that this economic depression would end if the government issued more paper money in circulation. Now, <clears throat> in order to issue more paper money, that money had to be backed by more gold. Well, there's only a limited amount of gold. And so those who wanted more money in circulation supported the idea that not only should gold be supporting the currency, but also silver. And in 1892, farmers formed a new political party. It was called the Populist Party. And farmers were interested in more money in circulation. Because if there was more money in circulation, then they would be able to pay off their debts, to pay off the mortgages on the farm. Not only that, but increased money supply would create a rise in prices. And so they would get more money for their crops. And so farmers supported the free coinage of silver. They wanted silver and gold to support the currency. The 
Populist Party of 1892 also favored a graduated income tax. That is, that the wealthier should pay higher taxes, uh, progressively higher taxes than those who are less wealthy. And the Populist Party also wanted the direct election of senators by the people. At this time, senators were elected by state legislatures. And the final plank in the Populist Party platform was that they wanted secret ballots during uh, elections. Now, the Populist Party was a third party in addition to the Democratic and Republican parties. And traditionally, third parties do not do very well in elections against the two major parties. But in the 1892 election, the populists won more than a million votes and the populist candidate won 22 electoral votes. And so because the populist party had such a strong showing in 1892, the Democratic party adopted the populist party platform in 1896. And so when we look at the Democratic platform in 1896, the Democrats supported the free coinage of silver at the rate of 16 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. The Democrats also favored a progressive income tax. The Democrats favored the breaking up of trusts and monopolies and stronger government regulation of railroads. And for their candidate, the Democrats chose William Jennings Bryan, a 36-year-old congressman from Nebraska. He would be the Democratic nominee in 1896. Now, William Jennings Bryan was known as the greatest orator of his age. And he addressed the issue of the free, of the coinage of silver in a speech known as the cross of gold speech in which he said, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor, this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Now, what he meant by this is that at this time, only gold supported paper currency. And as a result, there was just a limited amount of currency in circulation. And that favored, credit, that favored creditors and hurt debtors. And so Brian was referring to the, uh, just having gold behind the currency as a crown of thorns, as a cross of gold. He wanted both gold and silver to increase the amount of currency in circulation. The Republicans nominated William McKinley as their candidate in 1896. The election of 1896 exposed four fundamental divisions in American society at that time. It pitted business interests against farming interests. McKinley, the Republican candidate, represented the interests of industry, corporations, and big business, whereas Bryan represented the interests of farmers who wanted to see more money in circulation. Another division was conservative-minded people like McKinley versus reformers that wanted to introduce a graduated income tax that wanted popular election of senators. The 1896 election also represented city interests against rural interests because corporations and big business, big businesses were located in uh, cities versus uh, farming interests. And another division were those who supported just gold versus those who supported silver and gold. Bryan turned the Democratic campaign into a nationwide crusade. He traveled by train from one end of the country to the other, 
He covered 18,000 miles in the 1896 uh, campaign. He gave more than 600 speeches, sometimes 20 speeches in a single day. His energy and rousing oratory convinced millions of farmers and debtors that the unlimited coinage of silver was their salvation. The Republicans savage Brian. They called him a socialist, an anarchist, a communist, a lunatic, a madman, a rabble rouser, a traitor, and even a murderer. Some bankers told farmers that their mortgages would be foreclosed upon if they voted Democratic. Employers warned workers not to come back to work if Brian had been elected. McKinley's campaign was run by Mark Hanna, who pioneered many of the modern campaign techniques we have today. He was the Karl Rove of the 19th century. Even before Citizens United, Hannah invented the corporate sponsorship of political campaigns. Uh, he solicited a quarter of a million dollars each from Standard Oil and from J.P. Morgan. He used those funds to distribute tons of pamphlets, leaflets, banners, and posters, also uh, McKinley buttons. He used the money to buy off every major newspaper so that they would favor the McKinley candidate. He pioneered a new aggressive approach to campaigning by mail, spending $60,000 a week on postage, sending out 300 pieces of literature through the mail. In the end, McKinley won the election, 271 electoral votes to 179 for Bryan. So you can see McKinley won all the votes of the Northeast, the upper Midwest, as well as Oregon and California, those states in blue. And Bryan won all the states of the South, and of the West outside of Oregon and California. Brian's campaign marked the last time a major party would try to win the White House by exclusively courting the rural vote. So even though Brian won all these rural states, it was not enough to win the election. Now, the election showed that the country was shifting from an agrarian nation to an urban industrial nation. This would be the last time a major party would try to win by appealing to rural votes. And because the Democrats adopted the populist party platform, the populist party disappeared, it fell apart. And after 1896, the Republican Party, the party of big business, uh, Republican Party became the party of big business, whereas the Democratic Party became known as the party of reform. Now, before leaving the election of 1896, I wanna mention that this election was the theme of The Wizard of Oz. Now you may wonder why. Well, The Wizard of Oz was written by L. Frank Baum, who was a populist. And he wrote this book four years after the 1896 election. And throughout the book, there are references to the 1896 election. And so for the, the election itself was a parable on populism. And so Oz, O-Z, is the symbol for ounce. And 16 ounces of silver was the equivalent of one ounce of gold. Dorothy represents the common person, the common individual. The wicked witch of the East represents the large banks and corporations which were located in the East, which favored just gold 
The munchkins, I'm sorry, the Wicked Witch of the West represents mortgage companies that were foreclosing on farms in the West. The good witches of the North and South were representative of where the farmers lived. The munchkins represented common people. Emerald City represented Washington, DC. Emerald is green, the color of money. And it represented the federal um, monetary policy. The yellow brick road represented gold. And <clears throat> originally the slippers that Dorothy had were silver in the book, but in the movie, they decided to make them ruby red because that stood out better. And so the significance is the yellow brick road. If you follow the yellow brick road, that still did not get Dorothy back to Kansas. So the answer to America's rural problems was not gold. Instead, what got her back was by clicking the silver shoes. And so silver was the answer to the problems of the common person. <clears throat> the scarecrow was the symbol of the farmer. The tin man was a symbol of the industrial worker. And the lion represented William Jennings Bryan. Um, because he was known as the great orator, he was sometimes called a lion because of his um, verbal uh, abilities, uh, the great roar. And the wizard represents Washington politicians, um, the charlatans um, whose power rests on myth and illusion. Um, he ultimately proves to be powerless when the curtain is drawn away. So now the next time you watch The Wizard of Oz, think about the election of 1896, okay? <clears throat> now we're going to turn to the election of 1912. Teddy Roosevelt had served as president from 1901 to 1908. In 1908, he decided not to run again. Instead, he had appointed William Howard Taft as the Republican nominee in 1908. To, and he hoped that William Howard Taft would carry on his progressive policies. Now, um, Teddy Roosevelt was known as a trust buster. That is, he broke up monopolies and he promoted the preservation of the environment. And so uh, when he left office, here's a cartoon showing Teddy Roosevelt, who was also a hunter, um, breaking up these trusts. And so when he left office in 1908, he entrusted his policies to the next Republican president, William Howard Taft. And so here you see Teddy Roosevelt turning his policies in the form of an infant over to William Howard Taft, who's dressed as sort of a nursemaid. Uh, but Taft proved to be a very different president than Teddy Roosevelt. He was more pro-business. He was more conservative and more in favor with the old guard Republicans rather than the reformist Republicans that Teddy Roosevelt represented. And so when Teddy Roosevelt returned from an African safari in the spring of 1910, he was furious that his handpicked successor had yielded to the influence of old guard Republicans that Roosevelt had opposed. So here's a cartoon of Roosevelt looking from the outside, looking in 
and seeing how Taft had screwed up all of his policies. And so Taft was determined to reclaim the leadership of the Republican Party. And he announced he would challenge Taft for the Republican nomination in 1912. And that is what this cartoon shows. Now, in the primary campaign of 1912, Taft, Roosevelt beat Taft in nine of the 10 states that had primaries, but Republican state conventions all elected delegates that were committed to Taft because these state conventions were made up of old guard Republicans. Taft supporters controlled the Republican Party machine. And so when the Republican convention met in Chicago in June of 1912, they nominated Taft on the first ballot. And so an irate Teddy Roosevelt decided to run as an independent third party candidate. He created a brand new party on the spot. And this party was popularly known as the Bull Moose Party. And that nickname came from an answer that Teddy Roosevelt had given when a man in the crowd outside his hotel yelled, you're like a bull moose, Teddy. And that left the, his party with the nickname, the Bull Moose Party. Roosevelt's bolt from the Republican Party was one of the boldest maneuvers ever made by an American presidential candidate. And here is a cartoon showing uh, Teddy Roosevelt as a bull moose. And so the Republican party was split between Roosevelt, who was a progressive Republican and Taft, who was a conservative Republican. On the other hand, the Democrats took 46 ballots before they could decide on their candidate, the governor of New Jersey, Woodrow Wilson. And thus, in the 1912 election, Teddy Roosevelt had to run against, not only run against Taft, but also against two other candidates, Wilson, the Democrat, Taft, the Republican, of course, there was Roosevelt the Bull Moose, and Eugene V. Debs ran for president under the Socialist Party. And so the 1912 election was unique in having four candidates, sort of the way the 1824 election had four candidates. The 1912 presidential campaign was also one of the most bitterly contested campaigns in American history. Less than a week before the election, the vice president, James Sherman, died in office. And that left Taft without a running mate. While Roosevelt was campaigning in Milwaukee on October 14, 1912, a saloon keeper walked up to him and shot him. But the bullet lodged in his chest only after it penetrated both his steel eyeglass case and a 50 page single folded copy of a speech he was going to deliver. And so the bullet barely penetrated his body. And so Roosevelt was in full command of his dramatic talents. And so he began his speech by opening his jacket to show the crowd the bloodstained shirt. And he said, quote, I'm going to ask you to be very quiet and please excuse me from making a long speech. I will do the best I can, but there is a bullet in my body. He then delivered an hour and a half long speech. And after which he went to the hospital. That was vintage Teddy Roosevelt. Wilson benefited from the split in the Republican Party. And so he won 42% of the popular vote. 
as you can see in this pie chart. Teddy Roosevelt won 27.4%, Taft 23.2%, Debs won 6%. And there was also a fifth candidate running on the uh, issue of prohibition. And that candidate won 1.6%. So with 4.1 million votes, Teddy Roosevelt actually outpolled Taft. So here we can see um, Wilson won 6.2 million votes. Teddy Roosevelt won 4.1 million. Taft, 3.4 million. Um, and so that gave Wilson 41% of all popular votes, Teddy Roosevelt 27% and Taft 23%. But when it came to electoral votes, Wilson won 435 to merely 88 to Roosevelt and eight to Taft. The 4.1 million votes that Roosevelt won was extraordinary for a third party candidate. In fact, no third party candidate for the presidency before or after 1912 has received so large a percentage of the popular vote or as many electoral votes. Also, Eugene V. Debs won 6% of the 1912 vote. That's the largest slice of presidential balloting ever by a socialist party candidate. The significance of the 1912 election was that the election was a triumph for progressive reform because both Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt favored progressive reform. Um, such as the initiative and the referendum. Now, we in California are very familiar with a referendum. It's where people get to vote on um, legislative issues. Uh, progressive candidates supported antitrust legislation and the regulation of big business and the direct election of senators as well as a progressive income tax. And it was during Wilson's presidency that two amendments were added to the constitution, one calling for the direct election of senators and the other calling for a progressive income tax. And so here's a cartoon that explains Wilson's victory in 1912. A Republican party divided by a bull moose party resulted in a Democratic Party victory. Okay, now we are going to turn to the last of the five elections, the election of 1932 that took place during the Great Depression. The Democratic Party candidate, Franklin D. Roosevelt was not particularly popular with his own party. And the 1932 election took place amid the worst part of the Great Depression, 25% unemployment. Roosevelt barely won the nomination in the 1932 uh, Democratic National Convention. Many of the delegates considered him a lightweight. Walter Lippmann, perhaps the most famous journalist during that time, dismissed Roosevelt as an amiable Boy Scout, a pleasant man who without any important qualifications for office would very much like to be president. Opponents in his own party portrayed him as a flip-flopping, unprincipled politician. But he was a two-term governor from New York, 
And so he was nominated on the fourth ballot at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. And he gave a taste of his pension for breaking with tradition. Before 1932, no nominee ever accepted the nomination in person. But FDR flew from Albany to Chicago to personally receive his party's nomination at a time when most of the delegates in Chicago had never been in an airplane. And Roosevelt did it to show that his crippled condition was no handicap. He was suffering from uh, polio paralysis. He wanted to show that he was a man of action by getting on the plane and flying to Chicago. And in his acceptance speech, he promised a new deal for the American people. And that name stuck, the New Deal. Now, during the election, there were tensions between the Republican candidate, Herbert Hoover, who was the sitting president, and FDR. In fact, both Hoover and Roosevelt had been friends during World War I. FDR even wanted to be Hoover's running mate in 1920. But by 1932, they had become political enemies. Hoover wanted Roosevelt to endorse some of his policies in order to restore confidence in the American people. But FDR was a wily politician, and so he refused. Hoover wanted Roosevelt to declare a bank holiday along with Hoover. But Roosevelt wanted conditions to deteriorate so bad so that when he became president, he could declare a bank holiday and be regarded as the savior. Hoover refused to have his photo taken with FDR, explaining, I have too much respect for myself. <clears throat> FDR criticized Hoover for policies that he, FDR, would later promote. And so he criticized Hoover as not being committed to the idea that we ought to center control of everything in Washington as rapidly as possible. He attacked Hoover for budget deficits and called for sharp reductions in government spending. There really was no great debate over issues in the 1932 campaign. Little was said about banking, nothing about foreign policy. Both candidates called for a balanced budget. The major difference between the two parties were over the issue of prohibition. Prohibition was enacted in 1920 and the Republicans wanted to continue prohibition while the Democrats wanted to end it. It was a brutal campaign. Rumors circulated that FDR's polio was just a cover for his real illness, which the Republicans claimed was venereal disease. Hoover warned the electorate not to change horses in midstream during a depression. And FDR retorted, either change horses or drown. FDR's breezy optimism was a sharp contrast to Hoover's dour solemnity. Hoover never really had a chance to win. At the time of the election, industrial production was at a low ebb. Unemployment was widespread and farmers faced ruin. And so the economic conditions of the 1932 election has been compared to the current economic conditions today. Um, and Trump's challenge is to overcome the uh, dire uh, economic predicament that we are in today. And Hoover was not able to do that in 1932. And most people in America blamed Hoover for the depression. And so people sleeping on park benches uh, with uh, newspapers covering them, those newspapers were called Hoover blankets. And people living in uh, shanty town shacks, those shacks were called Hoover Bills. And um, one man uh, who bit into an apple and found a worm in it said, damn Hoover. So Hoover was blamed for everything. 
In the end, FDR carried all but six states in the 1932 election. He won all the states in blue. As you can see, FDR won the solid South. The South had voted solidly Democratic ever since the end of Reconstruction. Roosevelt also ran strong in the West, and he won the vote of urban immigrants. The Democrats also won both houses of Congress by big majorities. But FDR's victory was less an affirmation of his policies and more a repudiation of Hoover. FDR and Hoover never spoke to one another again. When they drove to the inauguration, this cartoon in the New Yorker depicts the um, feelings that existed between Roosevelt and Hoover. Supposedly, when Roosevelt became elected president, his first act was to rename the Hoover Dam and calling it the Boulder Dam. And when they asked him why he did that, he said that in his view, Hoover wasn't worth a dam. Well, that's probably not a true story, but it's funny to some degree. And so this cartoon shows how uh, people tended to blame the depression on Hoover and that accounted for uh, Roosevelt's victory in the 1932 election. When Roosevelt took the oath of inauguration, he famously said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But in fact, the American people had plenty to fear. No one was sure what Roosevelt was going to do once he took office in March of 1933. He had worked out very few plans for recovery, but if he had any plan for economic recovery early in 1933, it was almost identical to the measures that Hoover had already adopted, aid for farmers, promotion of industrial cooperation, support for banks and a balanced budget. But soon after his election, it became apparent that these policies would not get the United States out of the depression. And so he experimented. He tried one policy after another. If the policy failed, he was willing to try another policy. And that really is the big difference between Roosevelt and Hoover. Hoover was very doctrinaire. He was not willing to experiment, whereas Roosevelt was. And the New Deal revived the spirits of the nation. If Roosevelt had not won the election in 1932, there might have been a social revolution, if not bloodshed on a large scale if Hoover had remained president and the depression worsened. Roosevelt's New Deal coalition united groups that had previously not been associated with the Democratic Party. Um, these groups became known as the New Deal coalition, blue collar workers, Midwestern farmers, African-Americans, Southern whites, and Jewish Americans. They all voted solidly for Roosevelt and the New Deal. And this democratic coalition remained through the 20th century. Now, today's Democratic Party has some of those members of the coalition, but Democrats have lost blue collar workers over uh, the past few uh, elections. Midwestern farmers also no longer support Democrats the way they did during the uh, New Deal coalition. However, African Americans and Jewish Americans do support uh, Democrats by and large, but Southern whites certainly have left the New Deal coalition. 
Okay, so next week we are going to pick up with the election of 1940 and